right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, roundtable discussion on the state of the hypervisor markets. My name's Giles Syrett. I'm CEO of Shape Blue, the cloud stack company. Um, before I uh, let our panel introduce themselves, I just wanted to put some context about why we're doing this today. So, you know, at Shape Blue, we work, uh, we, we build IaaS infrastructures using Apache cloud stack. And as a cloud orchestrator below CloudStack, it relies on, on hypervisors. And CloudStack is hypervisor agnostic. It, it can choose, you, you can use whatever sort of hypervisor you want. Uh, but we do see with our customers, certain hypervisors sort of bubbling up as being the most popular choices. Uh, and often our customers say to us, you know, what, what's going on in, in the market, in the hypervisor market? What are the trends? What are you seeing? And the problem is there isn't really a hypervisor market because these are all part of sort of virtualization offerings from different communities, different vendors and what have you. So I thought today what we'd do is bring together uh, a set of people uh, who know these technologies very well and have had to make these choices uh, and have a discussion about where we see this all going and compare and contrast the different hypervisors. So let me introduce uh, the people who are going to be commenting today. So first of all, Olivier from Bates, the XCPNG guys, Olivier. Do you want to uh, say hello and tell everybody, you know, why you're here, what your experience is? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, guys. So I'm Oliver Lambert. Uh, as Guy said, I'm the founder and CEO of Vates, the company which is behind both XCP engines and Orchestra projects, now gathered into the one Vates virtualization management stack, which is uh, an open source and turnkey uh, virtualization solution. And I'm in open source since uh, now 20 year and uh, we are also contributing to open source uh, upstream like the Zen hypervisor. And uh, that's it to me. Cool. Thank you, Olivier. Uh, Lino? Yes. Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, my name is Lino Telera, and uh, I'm from Italy, and uh, I'm a cloud architect focused on um, infrastructure automation. I'm also a, a V expert, nine time V expert. So, yeah, I feel a little, a little bit holdy, but. Anyway, and um, yeah, um, today I'm working uh, as um, a, as a cloud architect focus on infrastructure automation, and then I already touch every uh, you know um, technologies uh, under the hood. But I'm f I was mainly focus on uh, VMware and the stuff uh, running on uh, the vSphere ecosystem, and then uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Lino. Wido. Yeah, so uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, Wido de Hollander, um, CTO at Your Online. Your Online, we um, are a large um, company in the, in, based in Europe uh, with uh, hosting in France and Spain and Netherlands. Um, we've been, I actually, we've been, but I've been a long time user of CloudStack since uh, 2011 and always using the, the KVM hypervisor. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Wido. And last but not least, Kev. Yeah, uh, again, thank you for having me. My name is Kev Johnson. I'm a tech marketing architect at Rubrik. Um, like Lino, I'm a long-term V expert. I can't remember if it's eight or nine years now, but I've kind of been in the VMware ecosystem for quite some time. I worked for them for a, for a little while, a, a few years ago. Um, and since moving to Rubrik, um, I've, I'm finding that I'm touching on a lot of different workloads and hypervisors. So I'm really kind of learning a lot of this stuff as I go. So um, while I might not have any hot takes on uh, Zen, for example, I can definitely speak to things like AHV, which is obviously KVM under the hood, and um, you know the kind of uh, the boogeyman in the room, uh, Microsoft Hyper-V. So yeah, looking forward to the chat. Brilliant, thank you, Kev. Well, I mean, let, let, let's get started. I mean, you know, as I said at the beginning, this idea has come around because what we see at Shape Blue with Cloud Stack is, you know. Predominantly, you know, three main hypervisors in play in, in our space, which is the IaaS space, the cloud space, right? We see VMware, uh, we see KVM, and we see Zen stroke XCPNG, or, or you know, Zen-based uh, virtualization. Uh, we also do see a little bit like you, you talked about there, the boogeyman in the room, Hyper-V, we see a li little bit of that. And again, you know, our thing is, is, is in the IaaS space, right? So, but first thing I'd just like to ask everybody, you know, compare and contrast. Why, you know, what 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 do you think are the the relative strengths, weaknesses of those different hypervisors in our space? And then also maybe extend that out a bit to a broader space. Let's talk, you know, generally about the the enterprise space as as, as well as just the cloud world that we live in. Who wants to go first? I'll chip in. Um, so yeah, just from a, from a VMware perspective because that's what I know the most. Um, so from from my perspective. 
you know, it's it's clearly it's been the enterprise market leader for quite some time. It's got a pretty mature ecosystem. There's lots of integration points. They have some good APIs, um, some not so good APIs, uh, but they have all of that. They've got the OEM partnerships. Um, they've also got things like Tanzu, which, you know, they're clearly going after the container ecosystem. Um, I'm yet to be convinced as to whether that's necessarily, you know, there's there's other players in the market, things like uh, OpenShift, which are obviously, uh, I, I, I personally think they're playing catch up with. And they've also got the, all of the the kind of like the VMware cloud on um, offerings as well. So for organizations that are looking to kind of get to the cloud, they've got that kind of tactical first step to 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 getting there. So that's that's kind of where I see VMware from from my perspective. I'll let someone else chime in. Well, I'll, I'll take it from here. So as I mentioned, uh, longtime user of KVM. Well, the, the reasoning for us for actually choosing KVM is that we have a large deployment of tens of thousands of virtual machines running nowadays. And we've always been building uh, our infrastructure based on open source. And that's where KVM fitted in very nicely. Starting in 2010, when it was first released, I think it was 2010, but it could actually be earlier. That's when we started the deployment and actually moved towards CloudSync because it was open source as well. And for us, the last 12 years, it, KVM really allowed us to modify, or actually, um, yeah, modify KVM and the ecosystem around it um, to make it work with our organization, with our wishes. So, um, um, yeah, it's a bit more work. And uh, one of the things is more difficult if you really go and want to get support, because who do you go to? Is it is it Canonical? Exactly. Is it Red Hat? Or is it Suze? Uh, but for us as a larger enterprise, or no, I wouldn't call us an enterprise, but as a larger, larger company, uh, we have the engineers in-house to actually run KVM uh, very well. That said, it doesn't mean you need to have dedicated engineers in-house to run KVM, but if you want to have support, you need to choose one of the distributions you go to. Okay, um, I, I will I will take it from here because uh, that's a very nice transition uh, after talking about uh, the open source KVM solution is the Zen one, which is uh, having kind of two different aspects, I would say even two life. Uh, you have the Zen alone, that is the same questions that for KVM alone is uh, where you will take support from Suzy, from uh, you know uh, some uh, people contributing to the, the project upstream. And that's, uh, it, it was the first, uh, historically the first open source hypervisor. So we got a lot of traction from the start. And then uh, KVM went on and then started to also have some traction uh, thanks to Red Hat and so on. But now I would say people are not truly using Zen alone by itself, but more into platforms. And I think this is something that is important uh, in the in the end of the day, as we are building a platform use, using Zen as its core, but uh, just having uh, the platform itself like XCPNG isn't uh, on the overall market because uh, with my hat, I'm not just, you know, uh, having the thing from the, uh, <clears throat> let's say the cloud market, but also in more general, I would say IT use cases. In general, now people start to seek about solutions that are not just the hypervisor, but the, the overall solution that just works. And on that regards, uh, I think this is where we could be both open source, but also easy to use. And, and that's why uh, for now we are uh, raising the interest uh, on our solution. Um, I'd like to put here on this table uh, some experiences uh, uh, on my yeah uh, professional life uh, before uh, landing into uh, v VMware vSphere uh, environment. So I want to say uh, that um, yeah I started early in a I don't remember when exactly, but um, yeah a lot of years ago, uh, more than ten years ago, so fifteen years ago with a, some open source solution in the company where I was working in a telco. We uh, were um, uh, in charge for uh, build a, yeah, a, a in, in, uh, internet service provider area and then moving on the cloud provider. So we are, um, yeah, our first mission was uh, bring anything, uh, nothing and build from scratch our cloud first cloud provider it was a really challenge um, yeah uh, thinking about uh, thinking that uh, we are starting 15 years ago so it was a, a really long time um so we played with uh, you know 
uh, Xen, KVM, this solution that was uh, uh, they were in a really early stage. They uh, were uh, yeah, they burn with um, uh, you know the ideas to become uh, an hypervisor and uh, and so. Then uh, be, yeah, we facing on uh, the problem of the operative model that we want to establish, and uh, also facing uh, on the people that are uh, more and more involved in uh, keep and maintain the hypervisor, the uh, life cycle, the work cycle of the every workload uh, on this uh, yeah. Uh, on on this hypervisor and uh, why we landed in we landed in uh, this sphere for two reasons mainly uh, one uh, was for uh, the operative model which is uh, yeah with by the integration with the other solution we other you know um, identity systems or uh, yeah the integration with the underlying switches the underlying storage and whatever uh, we started really really uh, fast deploying our uh, first infrastructure solution for our customer customers <clears throat> and then uh, secondly uh, for uh, you know the um, operative cost that uh, the uh, contracts with the uh, company so uh, the thing is uh, i put something for our customer and i'm in charge with them for keeping and maintain uh, the workload, but uh, who is the company that can give me the uh, right support in, just in case? This is uh, for a, for a, um, yeah, the amount of people that are working on that system that we were only 10 people in a, in the cloud division area, which is really, really, <laughs> yeah, a small number. Uh, and uh, yeah, today I want to say, uh, what company are still driving to have to still have this fair solution in their data center instead of put the uh, um, they workloads in the cloud? So probably uh, the operating model is the winning card. And uh, I want to say that uh, we are in, recently uh, there is another terminology is called super cloud, which is another operating model. So keeping the same operating model on premises and in cloud without uh, changing anything on the virtual machine and uh, 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 without changing also the organization inside uh, um, the companies. So and I think that this is uh, the way, the, the reason why uh, we are still, yeah, VMware is still one of the leaders or the leaders of uh, uh, the hypervisor, in my opinion. So, so, Lino, what you've outlined there, and, and actually tie it in with what you said, Kev, in terms of all these amazing things VMware as a vendor have got in place. You know, it's no secret they're the dominant vendor in data center virtualization, yeah. right? We, 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 we know that. So I asked the whole panel then, what, why do we see a significant number of people using alternative hypervisors? Because I've just heard, heard a very compelling reason there for, for running VMware, uh, KVM, XCPNG with you know Zen, Zen based stuff, and we are seeing a bit of a trend towards those other hypervisors in the cloud space, right? I keep saying that with the, with, with the, the caveat. Why is that? What's going on? Well, let me let me chime in on this one. Yeah, I, I, again, I speak for myself and what I see happening in the market around me is, you know, one of the reasons why we chose KVM is because there are so many um, the plugins for it, or plugins, so many. Um, ecosystem supported. For example, we're using Ceph as our storage deployment, and it's natively integrated into into Huey into KVM. So it made it very easy to deploy this and to run it. But it's also seen that KVM has a very stable track over the last ten years, where it has been proven to be a very stable hypervisor and just deliver what it needs to do is just doing virtualization for our cloud environment. And one of the downsides I personally see and reasons why people are moving towards KVM, not downsides of KVM, but downsides of, for example, VMware, is that you're really tied into a single vendor which dictates you on what kinds of things you can use. So integration into a certain type of switch or a certain type of storage. If it's supported by VMware, then it works. But with KVM, yeah, you need engineers who understand this stuff, but I also see that as a, as a bonus because otherwise uh, you'll have a company 
potentially, without any real knowledge inside the company, but just leaning on the support of VMware. And how does it really provide autonomy to your company? Because you're just depending on a, on a specific vendor, which has you tied into their licensing model, their contractual model. And I'm really happy that with our organization, we can make our own choices instead of having to think about, ah, does the licensing model allow us to do this? Or does the contract allows us to do this? Well, I have the freedom to operate as we think is necessary. And since KVM is just integrated into uh, into Linux, so in the major distributions, we can build around it, or we can we can pick building blocks from the internet around it to actually build our deployment and run it. Um, I'm not saying take every anything from GitHub, put it into your, your cloud deployment, and start running with it. Of course, do your due diligence, do your testing. But again, over time, it has proven for us to be the right decision to run a large uh, scale cloud deployment. Yeah, that- and I, I guess just kind of like to to kind of follow on from that it's the whole um what one of the things one of the reasons i think that vmware became so dominant was that ease of getting started you know you 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 didn't need to have a deep understanding of the linux kernel or any any of that kind of stuff so i'm i'm not entirely surprised um at, at, at what we're saying here about you know we're seeing organizations moving to alternative hypervisors like kvm because you know, the, the, to, to a certain extent, the hypervisor kind of became a little bit commoditized when any pretty much anybody could stand it up. Um, now, when we start talking about the capabilities of cloud provide, you know, of the hypervisor as an underlying technology for a cloud provider, KVM has a lot of advantages there. You know, it's 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 incredibly extensible. If you want to run something like vSphere um, as your underlying hypervisor for a cloud as a cloud provider, you're kind of tied into um, into their APIs, and you know, I can, I can, I, I, let's let's not go down that particular route. But you know, the, the APIs for vSphere, some of them are good, some of them are not so good. Um, you kind of have to deal with all of those things if you want to be integrating with stuff that there isn't an out of the box plugin for. So yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And then again, you know, just kind of coming back to um, that kind of ease of use. You know, if we if we think back, if I think back to my consulting days of you know I'd, I'd, I'd get a call and you know oh right yeah we we, we saw this script on um, we just copied this script off stack exchange and we ran it and now we've not got any mail servers you know th- there's have, having that kind of boundary to entry has has its advantages as well um you know from 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 a, from a technology perspective so yeah I can, I can kind of see both sides just because we've not mentioned hyper as yet though one of the things I do want to mention and, and kind of tying back into that ease of use, um, if I think back to when I first kind of got into technology, my background was Windows. I, I kind of did Windows for a long time. And from there, I went to VMware. The idea of, you know, SSHing into a box and managing it using the CLI, and all, that, was, that would have been terrifying to me. And I think one of the things that Microsoft had done pretty well with Hyper-V is they've made it really, really easy for, you know, if you're a two-person IT shop, you can go and stand up the hypervisor and you can get it running and it will work. When you start looking at things like, okay, well now I need to scale that thing out as a cloud, as something underlying a cloud provider, that's where it gets a little bit more tricky. So you've got tooling like SCVMM, which frankly isn't, that's it's not the tool that vCenter is. Um, the integration points, again, you know, you might find some PowerShell that, that will help you out there, but yeah, I, I can't see it ever becoming. I mean, I mean, I'm saying I can't see it ever be, ever becoming the the massive underlying hypervisor. We've obviously got Azure out there, um, but from a, I, I guess from a, from from a, a kind of like the below the hyperscaler tiers, I, I can't see Hyper V ever really taking off because of those reasons. Well, below one particular hyperscaler, right? Yeah. 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 Sure. <laughs> So, so we, we've sort of got, got drawn into the service provider space, into the cloud space, right? So Olivia, interested from the, the Zen XCP side, uh, do you see a lot of traction, a lot of change in, in that, it, which is our space here at Shape? Oh, yes. Uh, I mean, I mean clearly, so, so uh, as I stated before, um, I have the opportunity to talk with users and customers all around the world in very, very different businesses from people with maybe one machine to people is running cloud stack on top of it. So it's a very wide range. And there is a pattern that we started to observe uh, since last year. And to be fair, 
the uh, Broadcom announcement with VMware was truly triggering something. I mean, I even got, got some, you know, trend lines or even actual metrics that showed that the month it was announced, we kind of tripled the number of people registered to our newsletter. So there is a real trend that started then where right now I had maybe uh, one or two people coming to us. So I'm talking in terms of inbound, you know, asking about how to migrate from VMware to something else and uh, our platform, but in general, uh, seeking for getting out of VMware because those people had tons of different reasons. Uh, but, you know, Broadcom was a kind of maybe uh, uh, not the main reason, but something that triggered something, you know, the catalyst of something. And it's interesting because uh, what uh, Wido said just before is we, we a lot of people realize they were only had a very limited budget in terms of having actually hiring people to manage their IT. And they counted only on getting the chunkiness of VMware, which is working great to solve all the problems. So those uh, even large you know, companies got a really huge budget to purchase everything on the shelf, but they don't have the knowledge inside. And so at some point, when the provider is getting decisions that are not great for the future, they are kind of kind of locked in. And then they realize the way they, they did everything was, you know, convenient, but a kind of dangerous for the future of this business. So they start to think about moving out. And when they want to do that, obviously, they are not coming to us and said, I want to change everything tomorrow. Clearly, you know, they want to go by small steps. Um, but we this pattern is truly there for many reasons. Again, uh, it's not a problem of the quality of the product or whatever, but it's just people realizing due to the context, you might have some issues if you continue to count on just purchasing blindly without starting to think about the future and how to manage things in the future. But I also agree very much with Kev regarding the fact that VMware position of the market was always to say, we want to deliver virtualization in a way that's simple for the users. And uh, this is something that struck me, you know, I'm an open source believer from the start, you know, uh, uh, there is a gap in a lot of open source projects regarding the way how easy or complex a, a program could be to, to use, you know, you have uh, always the impression that is a do it yourself stuff. So that's how we build our own success is to get those you know, really great open source project, but build the glue around to get something that is kind of close of VMware in terms of impression of usage. That's the only way to compete. And I, and I agree that as soon as you do that, as Kev said, uh, then it's harder to fit in some cases where you need more flexibility. So it's a balance regarding what you need, something that is just work outside the box or something that is, uh, you know, more flexible depending on what you need. So there's no universal silver bullets, but I think that explains the new trend uh, with VMware that we can see right now. And so, and I want to pick up from that point is that we were talking about virtualization and all kinds of things and VMware, but one of the things we didn't mention is what I noticed quite a lot of times, people talk about virtualization, but they don't understand the difference between virtualization and a cloud environment. So I encounter quite a lot of people who are running VMware and they have like four hypervisors or maybe 10, Let, let's call it 10 hypervisors with a, with a few VMs running on there. And they say, yeah, we're using, we have a cloud. We're so, well, that, that's not actually a cloud. You're going into <laughs> VMware and clicking on create virtual machine and then run a virtual machine. And then they this say, is how you get well, your, um, your CIO to sign off on these things is you, is you get them to say, <laughs> okay, well, you can have the budget, but that's our cloud now. But you're absolutely yeah, right. Correct. So, but so they're running VMware and they say, should I switch to CloudStack? I've said, well, well, you're not running a cloud right now. If you're looking for a VMware alternative, you might want to go to Proxmox. So some credits to the guys from Proxmox who built something around the KVM hypervisor, which is super easy to deploy. You just download the ISO, install it on your machine without ever actually touching the CLI. You can start running with KVM and it has high availability, scalability, but it's still virtualization. So you can click on, I want a virtual machine, this kind of disk, et cetera, et cetera. Not the real cloud functionality. And then let me tell you what I think is a cloud. You have APIs to say, I want something which looks like this and this should become my virtual machine. And you get a response from an API telling you, so these are the credentials, IP addresses, and here's your, here's your instance. You want, you want a thousand? Sure, let's deploy a thousand. And, and that's the real difference from my perspective between virtualization and a cloud de uh, deployment. So a lot of people are using VMware just for virtualization 
and then they say they want to make the step towards the cloud, but they actually don't understand the difference. So um, if we're talking about alternatives for VMware, then I think also there are things out there which are running KVM, but not our particular cloud stack. So, so what, what what's in what's interesting is you know we we've all established VMware are the, the you know market dominant in this space. What we're starting I, I'm starting to pick up is that in our cloud space, like you were just saying, we know you know more open source adoption that sort of that that sort of thing. And I I think we you know we couldn't have this conversation without Broadcom coming up, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's like it it, it was it was going to get talked about. So. What, why do we think we're seeing that movement, right? What, what is it that was that's scaring people so much? Uh, you know, we, we talk about needing explosive scale in the service provider space. Why are people scared of what is ultimately just a straightforward acquisition? Yeah, I've, I've had some really interesting conversations around this. Um, and, you know, from, from Rubrik's perspective, you know, we, we're, we're not a cloud provider. We're not doing any of that stuff. But we touch all of these areas. And... We're seeing companies that are exploring alternatives uh, as their virtualization platform purely because they've looked at what Broadcom have done historically, what their business model is, which is they acquire something and you know they'll focus on their top 5,000 customers or whatever the number is, but they'll focus on the top end. And anything outside of that is kind of, is not a priority. I know I've got some really good friends that work at VMware and they will absolutely push back on me about this, but you know this is this is this is historically what they've done. Um, anybody in their right mind is going to look at that and say, "Okay, right. Well, we need to do a risk assessment for our business and determine: do we want to be do do we want? I'm I'm, I'm going to avoid the term vendor lock in, but do we want to continue down this path, or do we want to explore alternatives? And you know, I remember I remember back in the day. When back when I was still still consulting, and you know, Hyper V was the the latest thing, and so many VMware customers were just like, okay, right, that's cool. We're just gonna we're just gonna switch to Hyper V, and I saw how that panned out because they didn't really put a great deal of thought into it. It was like, okay, well, it's this is free, this is not free, therefore we'll do that. But I'm seeing organize, you know, I'm seeing international banks that are exploring alternatives, and you know, there's. It's it's a long tail to get from something that you can be so ingrained at with as a hypervisor to to move to an alternative. It's not an overnight process. So yeah, they're they're kind of looking at how Broadcom has historically done business. I know there's some people out there who are saying that Broadcom are not going to do that same thing with VMware. Um, obviously, every customer has to make their own decision on there. They make their own risk assessments. They decide. Uh, how they're going to balance that out and and take things forward. So yeah, that's that's pretty much Get it. my yeah. take on on the Broadcom stuff. I, actually, yeah. actually, Kev, sorry, I know I, I'm moderating today <laughs> and not actually on the panel, but we're seeing an interesting use case with CloudStack at the moment, which is people who don't really want to build a cloud. Yeah. What they want to do is abstract away from hypervisor APIs, specifically the, the VMware a API. You talked about hypervisor, uh, sorry, the APIs earlier. They want an abstraction layer to give them that independence. They, mm -hmm. They're not going to instantly migrate. You know, this is a massive decision. And some of these are sort of quite traditional enterprise organizations, but they want something in between uh, to give them a single API. So if that hypervisor yeah. changes at some point in the future, they, they can change. Sorry, I won't contribute anymore. <laughs> I'll let you guys. I, I, I just want to conscious of time and everything, but I'm it, I'm, I'm very conscious of the fact that nobody has said the word multi-cloud yet, which I think is, is hilarious. <laughs> but yeah, let's let's carry on. I, I want to put some uh, something. Yeah, I agree with Kev. So Kev is giving exactly what. Uh, yeah, the companies are still worried uh, worried uh, during yeah the announcement of the acquisition and and so. And I want to uh, put here in this table um, some experience uh, from the community side of VMware. So uh, in some, uh, yeah, um, a lot of companies, uh, when uh, they starting some changes inside the companies in, in their business and the way they are selling their products, probably the first impact uh, uh, is in, in the community, in the community, because they are cutting budget everywhere then they reestablish a new uh, asset new uh, yeah uh, organization and so 
but we are heard uh, the opposite uh, signals i want to say uh, they say that for the 2023 please do a lot of events do uh, evangelizing do uh, something on uh, yeah you know application space uh, network virtualization space and so and probably uh, the signal uh, uh, yeah if uh, i can read this signal as uh, yeah the broadcom has landed in vmware i know we know but they want to continue their business. They are not going to do uh, the same as uh, happened in the past with the other companies. So here I are, I have no solution. And I don't want to say that, uh, yeah, I'm really sure that will be happen. And probably in 2023, something will happen. I don't know. But uh, uh, the signals are, uh, yeah, are in that space yeah. are those. And um, especially in uh, the new, uh, because yeah, we, they are uh, running in the hypervisor space. They are still running in the hyper hypervisor space, but today uh, a lot of companies are moving on the cloud native space, especially on Kubernetes space. So this is the new trend that uh, all, uh, quite all the companies are uh, running their workloads. And uh, here, the answer of the question is, uh, uh, why I should I stay with VMware if I can choose another operative model that is completely abstracted uh, from the hypervisor? And uh, for this question, probably the multi-hypervisor solution can be a solution for a lot of companies, you know. Yeah. And um, yeah, probably uh, we must uh, put this, this discussion in uh, what company are changing during the last 10 years from the the um, uh, the perspective of running their workload in a VMs and today they are running their workloads in a container, which is it, a little bit different. That's, that's a really interesting point, Lino, because what five years ago, eight years ago, we were all going, well, you know, virtualization as a concept is 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 dead. Everything's going to be cloud native, right? Uh, but then at the same time, I've got some figures here. I think uh, global markets have got. 16 17 percent compounded growth to 2030 of the data center virtualization space so we're not sit well obviously we're seeing massive cloud native adoption but at the same time we're still seeing big growth in data center virtualization Why i mean that? those clouds have got to run somewhere right okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you know just just because people are doing things cloud native doesn't mean that the virtualization doesn't exist anymore it, the, yeah. the, the cloud is virtualization underneath yeah. right so <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, listen, I, I, I don't think VMware are going to, you know, they're, they're not going to disappear any, anytime soon. All of these cloud migration strategies, all of these different ways of doing things, they take a long, you know, they're, they're five, 10, 15 year processes, um, especially in the enterprise where things just move slower. But what I have seen, um, that I, I, I don't know, might, might tie in with, um, the, like the KVM, the, 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 uh, XCP type folks is we're seeing a new generation of software developers and they're growing up on open source. And so they don't have that kind of, they, they don't have that legacy of, oh, well, you know, we, 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 we grew up with Windows and so we know Windows. They're, they're just, they're happy with, with Linux. And so they're, they're building tooling and they're building applications that really tie in neatly with those open source um, platforms and, and I, th I think that's what that's probably one of the things that's going to continue to see uh, the growth in those areas so do you think that that will affect the market share then Kev I think over time yeah um you know so some of that stuff clearly is going to go cloud native uh, you know organizations are going to continue if you were starting a business right now and your business was some, something in the software you know you, you were building an application you're probably going to build it to be cloud native. You know, it's it's going to be a cloud native app. You're not going to go down the route of, well, we need some web servers and some load balancers and databases and things because the cloud provider gives you that. But at the same time, there's and there, there, there are so many use cases where organizations are kind of like, well, actually, we want that capability, but we need to be able to do that in our own data center because of, you know, regulatory reasons or security purposes or, or, or whatever. Um, and then there's gonna be organizations that are kind of like, okay, we wanna keep most of the stuff in our data center, but we wanna be able to 
leverage that same kind of interface to deploy things to a cloud provider. And that's, I think, where, uh, where folks like yourselves really, really kind of come into your own. Yeah, we, I mean, we, we are starting to see people repatriating workloads back out of the big hyperscalers. And to be frank, I mean, you know, we've always talked about, uh, you know, data sovereignty issues and that sort of thing. It's boiling down to, to dollars or pounds or yen uh, at the moment in terms of the margins that the hyperscalers are taking out of some of these organizations. It's much cheaper for them to, to run it themselves. Mm. But your, your, your point about open source and that generational shift around open, open source is an in, interesting one because Guido, Olivier, you know, you, you were saying you're open source guys from, from, from many years ago when, when you first started. Do you, do you see that change as well in terms of the customers you're working with? Uh, so, yeah. Go ahead, Widow. Go ahead. <laughs> so, I, I, from you, you're asking me, John, from a customer's perspective, what I see different nowadays is when I started 20 years ago, a lot of the things was do it yourself, duct taping, getting it all done, you know, compiling source code by hand because upstream it wasn't available. You know, those were the cowboy days. Those were pretty interesting. I learned a lot, but uh, definitely I'm not looking back, or like looking forward going back to those days. However, what I do see is that the younger generation growing up, is indeed um, used to working with the projects instead of building those projects. So they are used to working with, with cloud native applications, actually building cloud native applications, but actually building the cloud environment themselves, that is something they're not being taught anymore, actually seeking to learn. So what you see is we're, we're seeing more users, developers becoming more users. They expect an API they can consume and build their application instead of being the guys actually building the API and building the infrastructure underneath it. And so from our company, we're the guys building an infrastructure where the, where the stuff runs into. So we are seeking the engineers who actually can build a cloud environment. We also have the ones consuming the cloud, but most of the engineers are actually building our cloud environment. So that's that's something I see as well happening with, uh, with a newer generation, just consuming uh, the products in a different way. Olivier? Yeah, I, I will add something regarding the original question on having the uh, market still growing, uh, not just in the public cloud, but even on the uh, data center virtualization, but also the on-prem stuff. It's uh, also something we tend to to forget, uh, and it's not only related to open source, but uh, the cloud helps the uh, development of really new tools that are great, like infrastructure as code and things like this. But people tend to forget that you can now have those tools for even your own on-prem solution, meaning that at some point you can, you know, use those tools with the kind of similar flexibility that you could have in the cloud, but on-prem or to, a, let's say, a third, you know, party uh, hosting company and so on. Uh, so you you may know uh, uh, David Henson, uh, you know, from Hey.com, who are who is uh, publishing recently a lot of uh, blog posts regarding how they are going out of the cloud and doing things by themselves and I had the uh, opportunity to have a discussion with him regarding this um, and it's really interesting to see that they try to change their mindset but they couldn't probably do that in an efficient manner maybe 10 years ago because right now we could you know easily plug really great tools like Terraform and Sybil and things like this and with a I would say reasonable sized team even inside your company and a decent amount of knowledge but not something like you know being able to rebuild your Linux kernel or things like this you can already serve your developers to provide them a platform which is maybe not that polished at the cloud, but at least that you could build yourself without spending years to do. So I, I hope that's a good example on how this is shifting thanks to open source tooling that was meant initially for the tool that now you can replicate on-prem into some racks. And, and to finish on that, just people also start to realize that having machines is maybe having some maintenance for them, but they are really cheap. The increasing and in, uh, I would say even crazy amount of power you can you know put in one rack right now for re really uh, you know decent price is astonishing I mean uh, even you know you just get machines with Dell with epic CPUs and things like this you can cram uh, uh, something to be able to run maybe something like I don't know 90 percent of whatever software you need to run and to scale up to two racks will be already huge without having to go to a public cloud to do that. So that's food for thoughts, I would say. So to, to a certain extent, do we think, you know, thinking about external factors on the, the hypervisor space, do you think that, you know, what the hyperscalers are doing, their approach, their pricing, do you, do you think that's going to have a fundamental impact on what we see going on uh, within, within this space? 
Uh, it, well, in, in my opinion, uh, there's a different uh, cause for this thing. I mean, um, again, those are large markets. And uh, to be fair, as Kev said, uh, uh, things are going slowly in general. And even in technology, I would say, you know, uh, virtualization is not new. Uh, it's more than 20 years, maybe even close to 30 years old. It's, it's not new technology. Uh, people are not moving that fast. Uh, and We've seen trends, but in the end, uh, there is, I think, a space for everyone. And and this is something I maybe couldn't believe before being an entrepreneur by myself. But I realized, uh, uh, you know, there's space for people who want to go to the public cloud, people, people who want to do something else. And then now you have more choice than before, which is a great thing. And now I think everyone has to do his due diligence when, you know, having a, uh, to take some decisions, like Widow said, you know, uh, it's not just take VMware or go to Amazon. Now you have uh, the uh, spectrum of every possibility is really huge. And for your use case, you might find things that could be a good fit. There's no, you know, universal solution anymore. So I think it's better, uh, you know, <laughs> for a lot of reasons. I think it's 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 interesting the the, the 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 concept of you know having choice, and I'm probably a little bit off topic here, but having having the choice and being able to make those design decisions when you're deploying those workloads, whether you're de you know whether you're deploying them on premises, whether you're deploying them to the cloud, whether they're going to be containerized, whether they're going to be virtual machines. Whether it's something you still need to run on bare metal for one of the incredible corner cases that still exist for those things, you know th these 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 are tricky decisions to make, and it's easy to kind of get into the mindset that there is only one correct solution. Um, from from a hypervisor's perspective, I, I quite like the idea of um, you know what, what what the folks at, at CloudStack are doing. Um, you know, just kind of going well. You know, you, you can kind of use underneath more or less whichever makes the most sense for you yeah. um we're just going to abstract that complexity away and i think that's that's kind of the appeal of the cloud to me is this you know you don't have to worry about the hypervisor you don't need to worry about kernel patching you don't need to worry about any of that stuff you just need to kind of you need to figure out which apis you need to consume to deliver what you need to deliver um the challenge i guess is every time i log into the aws management console there's 125 new services that I need to learn the name of. Um, I'm exaggerating, but you know, you, you get the point. I, 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 can, I don't know anybody who can be an expert on all of those services. So you just kind of need to understand the bits that, that, that are going to do the job for you. And, and then maybe like the things that are adjacent to that. And then you're probably not going to, you know, I, I, I don't need to know anything about uh, machine learning in my, in my job. So I'm just going to push all of those things to one side. But from um, from an IaaS perspective, you know this 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 idea of abstraction gives you a degree of, of of simplicity, and I think I think that kind of ties right back to where we kind of started out when I was when I was talking about how I thought that VMware kind of became the dominant mark dominant market force, um, and not just being kind of like the category king, who who kind of invented that area, but you know they they got there, they made it consumable by everybody and at that point then it's just like well where, where, where do we take that from here and you know open to open to other ideas from folks all right guys we're we're, we're getting a little bit tight for time oh, on, yeah. on our slot so i i'm gonna i'm gonna just finish up with uh one question if we could just come around each of you uh and answer it relatively briefly i'm gonna combine it i'm gonna say okay so, so in the hypervisor space what do you see going on over the next few years maybe the next five years what external factors do you think are, are going to affect that? And also, you know, we haven't talked about a whole range of other <laughs> advisors that are out there. So if, if you want to name drop anything else you think is, is interesting that we should have probably discussed earlier in this conversation, drop it in. So uh, I'm doing it in the order I can see you on the screen. Olivier. Yeah. So in, in very short, I think what we will see is a more segmented market. Uh, like, uh, you know, with still VMware having a large chunk of this market, which is something that, as we said, companies aren't moving very fast, but having more competitors, but also all of them ideally having kind of getting the role of uh, having a universal tooling on top of it, like you know, uh, cloud stack, but also having APIs that could use Terraform and things like this. 
giving the choice on the best tool you need to use for your use case. And I think that's the future is being aware, educated about, you know, uh, the solution that might be required for you, regardless they are open source or, or not and things like that. But truly the future is you need to spend more time investigating the solution that might be the right one to find also which one could be uh, uh, use the right tooling on top of it, cloud or not cloud, or even for small infrastructure. Cool. Thank you, Lino. Yeah, I agree with Oliver. So it's a really good point here because, uh, yeah, the trend is not to uh, um, establish what uh, hypervisor is used is better for me, for my company, and whatever. So that we are playing uh, in, a, in a world with a, a lot of abstraction and uh, keeping the focus on uh, on the hypervisor itself or better, on the implementation of uh, the, the, the several hypervisor or the usage, the balance between the usage by, by the data center and the cloud. I see two trends. One trend is the a lot of application will move naturally in uh, in the cloud because yeah uh, the cost reduction uh, and uh, the new operative models are so also um, a lot of companies are incentivated to put them because uh, you know the Kubernetes space uh, and also the cloud the evolution of the application in the cloud native application. In the other side, we will see probably an increase of the data the edge data center. Uh, so probably the hypervisor will play uh, a great role here, and probably the choice of uh, what what better that not. Uh, Mm, yeah, I want to say not the better hypervisor, but the, the best solution, because we are now, mm, we should talk about the solution and integration is better to manage all of the things that are running on the cloud and on the, and on the edge. So this is my my point of view. Brilliant. Thank you, Lino. Kev, I'll come to you next, because I know you've, you, you've got a hard stop at the end of this session. <laughs> In, indeed, um, I'll keep it simple. So I think we're going to see um, greater abstraction. So we're going to see more abstraction layers so that people can consume those hypervisors without actually having to care what those hypervisors are. And I think we're going to see uh, more integration points. So, you know, API consumption points, things like um, we've mentioned Terraform, we've mentioned Ansible, all of these kinds of things, I think are going to be key to the next four to five years uh, in the hypervisor space. Get it. Thank you. And finally, we don't. Yeah, so <clears throat> I actually kind of agree with, with Kevin. We're, we're also saying we're agreeing with everything. But um, what I see is that the hypervisor market has quite matured. So the hypervisors themselves are mature, they're stable, they're running, they're performing, but then actually they're not performing. Because what we're seeing is that CPUs have become so 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 fast and hypervisors are, are fine with CPU. Memory is fine as well. When we're talking about disk access and network access, all the hypervisors are still lacking. So um, I'm going to take VMware as an example. It has some great um, uh, integrations with uh, uh, NVMe over Ethernet or NVMe Fabrics, but that's all very tied to specific vendors. And we're still not there yet with the hypervisor that we have open standards where we can talk to NVMe in a standardized way and get all the performance out of the NVMe. So we, we're seeing some integrations there. And the same goes for the 100 gig networking for 400 gig networking or even 25 we're not getting the performance in the virtual machines yet as we're expecting on bare metal so kev you said you know we have this these corner cases of bare metal yes sometimes if you run they have the super high performance on disk io and network you still need to go to bare metal and i think this is where we're going to see the market actually maturing and evolving in the in the next couple of years actually getting more performance out of the virtual machines because we want to run more workloads inside those vms and not on bare metal anymore cool Thank you guys, that's been some fantastic insight. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, for people watching this, uh, if you wanna get in touch with any of the guys on the panel or myself, some point somewhere on this screen, you, you should see some contact <laughs> details. Thanks for listening. Thanks for your time very much today, guys. Uh, see you again soon. Thanks for having me. See you. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you guys. Bye, have a nice day. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Thank Everybody you. All right. Great conversation. Thank you.